So November 19th, 2013 is today, is the 150th anniversary of the day that Abraham Lincoln delivered what we now know as the Gettysburg Address. Speaking of the soldiers on both sides who fought and died there, Lincoln accurately predicted that the world would, quote, never forget what they did here. Indeed, I think you could make a case that the Battle of Gettysburg is probably the most significant encounter between armed combatants in the history of North America. We all know and remember what happened there, but do we really understand the hows and the whys? To examine questions like these, we've assembled a panel of some of our favorite historians from the Department of Military History at the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. Their mission is to give us some fresh perspectives on the Battle of Gettysburg and its place in American history and American memory. Presiding as moderator of this distinguished panel is Dr. Ethan S. Rafus, professor of history at the Command General Staff College and the orchestrator of this entire Civil War sesquicentennial series we've been doing at the library for more than two and a half years. Um, Ethan, I should tell you, uh, received his PhD in history and political science right here locally at uh, the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He has taught military history at uh, West Point, and since 2004, he has been a member of the faculty at the U.S. Army Command General Staff College. Um, but that's not all. He also serves on the editorial boards of the Journal of Military History and Civil War Times, Illustrated. He's published over 250 essays, articles, and reviews, and is the author, editor, or co-editor of several books, two of which are forthcoming. Uh, scheduled to appear in 2004. These include Corps Commanders in Blue and the Army War College Guide to the Richmond Petersburg Campaign of 1864-65, which I suspect we'll be hearing about in 2014. Well, actually most important to us, perhaps, um, he's already given me the Civil War sesquicentennial schedule for 2014. <laughs> so there is more to come. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ethan Rafuse. Thank you, Henry. <clears throat> uh, today is the 50th anniversary of when a president, John F. Kennedy, was originally scheduled to go to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania in honor of the centennial anniversary of the Gettysburg Address. But instead, his advisors suggested he take a trip to Texas instead. Interesting. Was Gettysburg the most important event of 1863? That's the question we're going to discuss tonight. History, of course, is sometimes been called an argument without end, at least until I presented my case and the argument ends because, well, self things, some things are self-evident, right? The B B Battle of Gettysburg. Was it the most important event of 1863? It certainly occupies a central place in the way we think about not just 1863, but the entire Civil War. Uh, its importance, obvious military, re military purposes it served. It stopped Robert E. Lee's invasion of the North that carried the war uh, to the Susquehanna River into the outskirts of the capital of Pennsylvania. And it inflicted casualties on Robert E. Lee's army that would be irreplaceable. Um, the Army of Northern Virginia would never be so formidable a force as when it moved north into Pennsylvania. And after that, oftentimes it's viewed as a long, long steady slide downhill. Sort of the pinnacle of the, of the Army of Northern Virginia's existence, the, you, the Confederate war effort is viewed as Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, as is often viewed as a turning point. Casualties, of course, from the battle were enormous. 23,000, over 23,000 for the Union, over 23,000 for the Confederates. And in the war of attrition and exhaustion, these were casualties the Union could accept a little bit better. A little bit better, uh, because you know, the campaign, had it turned out differently, um, could have had a morale effect that would have canceled out these losses for the Confederacy. Also important, like I said, it provided an important morale effect for the Union. At the time in 1863, you had a very influential copperhead movement in the North 
I feel I must mention that because Jenny Weber is here, and she's written an excellent book on the Copperheads, her heroes. Um, <laughs> maybe not your heroes, but you know, you like them enough to write a book on them. Okay. They're such bad boys. They're such bad boys. Yes, <laughs> you can't help but love them. Uh, so Gettysburg has its <coughs> enormous dramatic effect. It has the casualties. In addition, it also has, am I making the case, a professor of rhetoric and classics from the state of Maine by the name of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, who in 1888, on a dedication of the monuments there, gave a talk. And I'll quote that. This sort of tells you about the symbolic importance that Gettysburg takes. Began Chamberlain, he said, no chemistry of frost or rain, no overlaying mold of the season's recurrent life and death, can never separate from the soil of these consecrated fields the lifeblood so deeply commingled and incorporate here. Ever henceforth under the rolling suns, when these hills are touched to splendor with the morning light, or smile a farewell to the lingering day, the flush that broods upon them shall be rich with a strange and crimson tone, not of the earth, nor yet of the sky, but mediator and hostage between the two. But these monuments are not to commemorate the dead alone. Dead was but the death was but the divine acceptance of life freely offered by everyone. Service was the central fact. That fact and that truth these monuments commemorate. They mark the centers around which stood the manhood of Maine, steadfast in noble service, to the uttermost, to the uppermost. Those who fell here, those who have fallen before or since, those who linger yet a little longer, soon to follow, all are mustered in one great company on the shining heights of life. With that star of Maine's armorial ensign upon their foreheads forever, like the ranks of the galaxy. Any event that can inspire that kind of rhetoric certainly deserves a hallowed place in American history as one of, if not the most important event of 1863. Now, if you need further evidence of this, before we can go from the highbrow approach, we can take the lowbrow approach. Gettysburg 2013. The lady on the right is my lovely daughter, Corinne, with her Hickory High, Hickory Huskers jersey. Her love of the underdog, so obviously she must be the Confederate here. <laughs> the individual on the left is Brooke Simpson, who is obviously unimpressed with her arguments about the value of underdogs. <laughs> Brooks is a New York Yankees fan, which may explain that. Brooke Simpson is a distinguished scholar, perhaps the most distinguished scholar of this generation of the life and career of Ulysses S. Grant. And yet, in the summer of 2013, 150 years later, and this is looking right at you, Greg, with your Vicksburg argument, Grant's leading biographer is not at Vicksburg. He is at Gettysburg, like Joshua Chamberlain at those, those hallow fields. Now, I will present to you the other individuals who will be trying, vainly, no doubt, to counter my presentation. <laughs> I'll introduce them right before they come up and a little commentary on them. The first person to speak will be Dr. Gregory Hospital, who earlier this year you heard give a presentation on the Vicksburg campaign. And he will obviously try to lead you to believe it was more important than anything I could say. But give him his chance. Now, I talk about Greg, my daughter. I was like, she's like, who's Greg? She's like, is he the one with the bow tie? Just yeah, that's Greg, the one in the bow tie. Greg Hospital was a graduate of the College of William & Mary, the University of Mississippi, and Louisiana State University where he completed a dissertation looking at the Mexican War of 1846-48. Since joining the CGSE faculty in 2008, Dr. Hospital has served, has served as, among other things, author of the Clouds of its in Joe Manee lessons, assistant director of the Staff Ride Program, and the Department of Military History named him its Teacher of the Year for 2011. He is an associate professor. Like I said earlier this year, he gave you a presentation on Vicksburg which I believe he is going to argue was more important than Gettysburg. Good luck, Greg.
Well, how does one follow that other than to say, I, I'll follow the uh, recommendation of a uh, Methodist preacher. I grew up in a little town in Virginia, and he said, Greg, public speaking's easy. Be short and have a point. And <laughs> I, I will guarantee you that I'll be short. Uh, you get to determine whether or not I have a point. And in short, my answer to Ethan is, uh, Ethan, no, Gettysburg isn't the most important event of 1863. And uh, can we get the next slide, please? Yep, right. Oh, I do. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. There are my three points. Uh, and I'll talk briefly about the uh, significance of Vicksburg militarily, politically, and psychologically. And I'm just going to make a few points. Um, first of all, what I'll say militarily is uh, more casualties were inflicted on the Confederates at, during the Vicksburg campaign than were at Gettysburg. An entire field army is removed from the Confederate order of battle. Uh, 172 artillery pieces are captured, uh, 50,000 small arms, and Grant suffers less casualties than Meade does there. So at least by that military metric, uh, the, the campaign at Gettysburg was more significant. The, even more important militarily was that after Vicksburg, Confederate military prospects in the Western theater, that is west of Georgia, were dismal. The loss of Pemberton's army left Mississippi and Alabama almost devoid of troops. Vicksburg, in short, set a downward course in the west from which the Confederacy never recovered. Ulysses S. Grant learned lessons, and my question about Brooke Simpson would be, how much was he paid to go to Gettysburg then? And I think there are, they don't, in any case, would be there might be a reason that he was there during the summer. But Grant learned lessons, and what we tend to forget about Ulysses S. Grant is he was not full born into the general that he was in 1864. He learned lessons throughout his career in 1862 and in 1863. He gained determination and imperturbability from his experiences at Fort Henry, uh, uh, Fort Donelson, and Shiloh. To this, he adds aggression, flexible tactics of maneuver and deception. He forced the enemy to move, Pemberton that is, to confront him during the Vicksburg campaign. Later, as at Vicksburg, he will turn Lee's army in 1864. Sherman, too, learned at Vicksburg, and he, of course, will play a major role in 1864 as an Army commander himself. He would use much the same method with few exceptions. Finally, I'll say this. This is one of the sterling examples the Vicksburg campaign is of joint operations. That is the cooperative effort between the Navy and the Army. And I would throw this out to you. The School for Advanced Military Studies at the Command and General Staff College spends their summers at Vicksburg, not Gettysburg, <laughs> studying that campaign. <laughs> so much for the military aspects of the campaign. <laughs> Politically, Vicksburg weakened the already tenuous position of Jefferson Davis. He dealt with the feud between John Pemberton and Joseph Eggleston Johnston, even as he dealt with his own with the notoriously uh, argumentative Johnston. After Vicksburg, Southerners began to look away from Davis and toward other military leaders, especially Robert E. Lee, for their salvation, despite Lee's loss at Gettysburg. In other words, Vicksburg put the nail in the coffin of Davis as the Confederate leader. Grant politically becomes Lincoln's man, and his star will continue to rise, culminating in an ill-starred two-term presidency. Of course, maybe for the nation, in one sense at least, politically, this would have turned out better had he lost. That being said, it's because he won that he becomes president. Finally, it solidifies political support in the vital Midwest in the North. Psychologically, Grant's success at Vicksburg entered the Southern psyche of the soldier and the civilian alike, as no other 1863 victory did. Like the French at Verdun in 1816, the Confederates had declared they shall not pass. Grant's army, of course, could and did pass. The battle lived on in songs, poems, prints, letters, newspaper stories, and magazine articles, both north and south of the Mason-Dixon line. And after Vicksburg, the specter of defeat loomed large in the south, while confidence grew in the north. In sum, and this is the short part, right? You get to determine whether I've had a point or not. The South saw their nation fractured 
and an army captured as a result of the Vicksburg campaign. Gettysburg, despite the casualties, pales in comparison. Chickamauga, who Dr. Mullis will talk about, provided but a brief respite from the gloom of defeat. And without military victory, the Emancipation Proclamation wouldn't have mattered, nor would the Gettysburg Address. Consequently, July 4th, 1863 marked the beginning of the ebb tide for the Confederate nation, and with it, the dawning of a new era in the history of the United States. And I want to thank the library for putting on this little historical case match as well. I finish up my time. That was a nice try. Uh, <laughs> our next speaker is my daughter, again, was asking who was going to be on the program tonight. And when I told her Terry was going to be on, her response was, yay. <laughs> a sentiment I'm sure many people who have been to these presentations before would echo, because he's a very popular speaker in this series. And he's always good, a good go-to guy in it, because I know you all like him for good reason. Terry, as you've you no doubt heard before, he is originally from Pennsylvania, earned his bachelor's and his master's degrees in history from Shippensburg University, which is fairly near Gettysburg, um, just over South Mountain. He earned his PhD from the University of Arkansas, where his research focused on Major General Samuel Ryan Curtis and the Civil War in the Trans-Mississippi. He is currently an associate professor in the Department of Military History, which is recently promoted to associate professor. Um, and he's authored numerous published essays, including several in the Library Here's series on the Trans-Mississippi War and the Border series. Um, he is currently working on a book, tentatively entitled Pragmatic Abolitionist, Contrabands, Samuel Ryan Curtis and the Army of the Southwest in the White River Campaign of 1862. And he will be speaking on, well, the Gettysburg Address, which is close enough to me that I can feel some support for my argument. But we'll let Terry speak for himself. Thank you. <clears throat> the most important event of 1863, and I think one of the most significant events in all of American history, is an event that happened 150 years ago today, the Gettysburg Address. In some respects, it's a little bit difficult to argue this because the Gettysburg Address legally does nothing, but in many respects, it does almost everything. And I'm going to read you the whole address because Lincoln was a very pithy writer and, and brilliant, brilliant speaker. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth in this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met in a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that this nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this, but in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining for us that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. Abraham Lincoln, 19, November 1863. <clears throat> Lincoln lays out in 272 words what the war was really about, redefining and clarifying the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence is the closest thing we have to a sacred document. And it only did one thing that, that had legal ramifications. It declared our independence from Great Britain. But like the Declaration, but, but what it does is it lays the ideological foundations for what this nation was built upon. Belief in the ideals of the Declaration of Independence is what makes us Americans. The ideology of the Confederacy, however, argued that Jefferson omitted a key word in his famous Declaration of Independence, that it should read, quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all white men are created equal. 
Lincoln rejected that notion and attempted to deliver on Jefferson's promise long delayed from 1776 when the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect on January 1st, 1863. But Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation did not free all the slaves, and if you have taken the time to read it, nobody remembers it because it reads like a legal brief, which is what it is. The Gettysburg Address is Lincoln's declaration that the U.S. was going to live up to Jefferson's lofty words and equally lofty prose. For Lincoln, liberty and union were inextricably intertwined. And he says this very clearly when he says, quote, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. <clears throat> Lincoln also had to sustain the Union's will to continue the war to the finish. Considering the casualties of battles like Gettysburg, Antietam, Shiloh, Pea Ridge, Chickamauga, Wilson's Creek, much had been sacrificed by many just to get to this point. There was a long way to go until the war was concluded successfully, and Lincoln needed to sustain morale for not only the federal soldiers, but the northern public. To do that, Lincoln needed to demonstrate clearly what was at stake, and he does that. He says, quote, It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that those honored dead we take, th those honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died un in vain and that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people will not perish from the earth. What Lincoln is saying here is that not only is the concept of liberty in the United States at stake, but democracy for mankind in general. This is not just a war to see if the union could be maintained, certainly not by this point. It was a war to see if democratic principles could work in such a large and diverse nation. And although he left it unsaid, and Lincoln never mentions the word slavery in the, in the uh, Gettysburg Address, it was a chance to correct the great flaw in the nation from its inception when it staked out these, dem these democratic and egalitarian principles, and yet still held men and women in bondage, depriving them of their inalienable rights of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for no other reason than the color of their skin. So the men making up the federal army and the civilians on the home front we're not just being asked to continue making sacrifices for those that already made the, uh, the ultimate sacrifices, although they were. They were being asked to continue to make sacrifices necessary for victory for future generations. Perhaps this is what fascinates me and others about Lincoln, that he could elevate something so terrible as war and not necessarily ennoble war itself, but ennoble the goals of that terrible conflict. That Lincoln was successful despite the, 90, the, 100, the nearly 100-year-long struggle for civil rights for African Americans, is demonstrated because much of what has transpired since the Civil War, the fight against Jim Crow, against totalitarianism, including World War I and, and fascism in World War II, communism in the Cold War, can be chalked up to living up to Lincoln's reinterpretation of the Declaration of Independence. Thank you very much. So after the man with the bow tie, after Ye, it's a man with two names. Randy Mullis, Tony R. Mullis, is an associate professor at the Department of Military History at the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College. He holds his Ph.D. in history from the University of Kansas, and his major fields are the history of the United States and military history. He has taught at the United States Air Force Academy, the Air Command and Staff College, and he has pub he's published various journal articles associated with Kansas history. His book, Peacekeeping on the Plains, Army Operations in Bleeding Kansas, was published in 2004. He served 23 years in the U.S. Air Force as an intelligence officer and retired in 2005. Uh, his presentation earlier this year was on Quantrill's raid and the war along the border, and he will come up with another response to Gettysburg, was Gettysburg the most important uh, event of 1863. Randy? As much fun as Quantrill would have been to uh, bring up one more time, uh, I'm going to introduce something tonight that I just have to ask. How many have heard of the Tullahoma campaign? Well, yeah, my colleagues um, and their spouses. Okay. Um, that's, that's basically what I expected tonight, and, and so you don't have to ask any questions. How's that? Okay. But we'll see what happens. But 
I went to a conference and heard a speaker, a guy named Rich Donardo, who teaches at the Marine Corps Staff College, and he made a compelling argument that, hey, you know, everybody knows about Gettysburg, most people know about Vicksburg, but there was a third campaign in the summer of 1863 that was equally, if not more, decisive than those two earlier ones. So let me pitch my argument and we'll see what happens with that. So how do I know Tullahoma was so important? Well, I went to the source. I said, Mr. Lincoln, uh, of the three campaigns of July of 1863, which do you think is the most important? Well, you know, Gettysburg is, is, is very important. So is Vicksburg, but you know, nobody really talks about Tullahoma. And it's going to be Tullahoma that really is the knockout punch to the Confederacy. Hold that thought. We'll see if you believe it or not when I get through with it. Another part of the problem with Tullahoma, not only have most folks not heard of it, do they recognize any of the major commanders at Tullahoma? Anybody? Bueller? Uh, the usual suspects. Again, okay. Uh, to your right is the irrepressible Braxton Bragg, and he has a fort named after him, by the way. Uh, and to your left is William Stark Rosecrans. That work for anybody? <laughs> okay, now you heard the names. Okay, but that's part of the problem with Tullahoma is no one's really heard of it, and why am I up here taking five to eight minutes, right, Ethan, uh, to try to convince you that it was, if not the most important, one of the more important campaigns of 1863. Well, I think the best way to do that is, again, go to the sources. And what I have for you here are as an exchange between Secretary Edwin M. Stanton and General Rosecrans himself. And this is on the 7th of July, uh, three days or four days after, or three days rather, after the 4th. This is the letter to General Rosecrans. We have just received official information that Vicksburg surrendered to General Grant on the 4th of July. Lee's army overthrown. Grant victorious. You and your noble army now have the chance to give the finishing blow to the rebellion. Will you neglect the chance? Okay. Now, had something else happened, you probably would have heard of the Battle of Tullahoma or the Campaign of Tullahoma and, and the subsequent end of the war. Obviously, that did not happen, but hold on. This is General Rosecrans' rather snarky response. <laughs> Honorable Secretary, just received your cheering dispatch announcing the fall of Vicksburg and confirming the defeat of Lee. You do not appear to observe the fact that this noble army has driven the rebels from Middle Tennessee, of which my dispatches, dispatches advised you. I beg in behalf of this army that the War Department may not overlook too great an event because it is not written in the letters of blood. I have now to repeat that the rebel army has been forced from its strong entrenched positions at Shelbyville and Tullahoma and driven over the Cumberland Mountains. My infantry advance is within 16 miles and my cavalry advance within eight of the Alabama line. No organized rebel force within 25 miles of there, nor on this side of the Cumberland Mountains. Respectfully, William Stark Rosecrans. Greg and Ethan mentioned casualties. And I guess if it bleeds, it leads. You've heard that before. The casualty rate that Rosecrans' Army of the Cumberland suffered was 569. If I were to ask you, which commander do you want to work for? <laughs> General Meade, who lost 23 or so thousand. General Grant, what was it, 68? I forget exactly. I think the choice is easy. The accomplishments of General Rosecrans have been far underappreciated. And I think this is an opportunity to at least introduce this notion of Tullahoma to this fine audience here in Kansas City. So why is Tullahoma, or at least should be considered, one of the more important campaigns of 1863? Well, Gettysburg, as Ethan rightly points out, did stop the powerful Army of Northern Virginia. And I'm kind of using a boxing metaphor here. The Union took the best the South could deliver with a great right hook. They withstood the blow, and Lee had to retreat. But when you think about it, Lee goes back into Virginia, Meade recovers, what's really changed? The war goes on. Vicksburg, as Greg rightly points out again, great maneuver, great battles, uh, storybook uh, understanding of warfare, but yet, what did it really do? Using my boxing metaphor again, it did sever virtually the left arm of the Confederacy, but the Confederacy rarely loses its left arm anyway. Okay, because when you think about it, when you look west of the Mississippi, many folks refer to it as E. Kirby Smithdom, that there was a whole nother war 
regardless of the connection between the West and the East. Yes, it did geographically separate the South, but did it really get to the heart of the matter, which leads me to Tullahoma, which did go for, again, to use the boxing metaphor, the solar plexus. It didn't kill the South, it didn't destroy the South, but it brought the South to its knees. Because the Tullahoma campaign doesn't bag an army like Grant did at Vicksburg, it doesn't hold the blow that Meade received against Lee at, at Gettysburg, but it did force an army virtually out of Tennessee into Chattanooga and shortly thereafter out of Chattanooga into Georgia. Yes, there was an oops, Chickamauga, uh, and yes, there was Chattanooga again, but because of Tullahoma, it set the scene for Sherman and his little foray into Atlanta and to Savannah and other parts of uh, Columbia, South Carolina, where you dare not mention his name even to this day. So Tullahoma, in my opinion, deserves a lot more recognition than my poll did here tonight about its significance to the overall campaign. But as a bottom line, I think you have to look at all three campaigns. No one defeated the South because, as Henry rightly pointed out at the beginning, we're going to have more of these discussions next year and the year after that. Okay, so none of these were, would be what we call decisive battles, but collectively, this trinity, this troika, this trifecta of campaigns began the beginning of the end of the South. And I do have one quote here in regard to Chickamauga. Yes, the casualties were horrific, 34,000 between the North and the South. But as Daniel H. Hill uh, reports in here, as a result of Tullahoma, as a result of Chickamauga, the South, even in victory, was essentially defeated, albeit it will take another year and a half before Appomattox and the end of the war. There you have it. That's my argument. And I think at this point, Ethan, you have the stage. If the, if the gentlemen from the panel will move on over to the seats over here so that they may face the audience. Uh, yes, and you do need this. Uh, you've heard the, the four presentations here, the correct one and the other three. Correct. Yeah, that's, that's you, Greg. Remember, Sam's is for the people who need two years at Fort Leavenworth, right? Okay. But here, so, we, but I think we'll turn it over to you. Your take, your questions. We talked about some battles and campaigns the Gettysburg Address, but 1863 saw a lot of events. And so, your questions, and sir, back there. Uh, I, I admit I never heard of Tullahoma. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, what is it geographically? A city, an area, a area? Randy? The question is, Tullahoma, is it a city, is it a town? Randy? Ethan, if you could fast forward to the end. I've got a, a map just for that question, believe it or not. Not to give away the other stuff. Yeah, that one. Uh, Tullahoma is in of itself a, um, a, a city, or, or town would be, or village even, would be more accurate. Uh, it is a railroad hub, which makes, gives it strategic significance uh, on the Nashville to Chattanooga Railroad. Uh, and there's a spur that goes up to Manchester uh, and McMinnville, or, or in, in Tennessee and Manchester, okay. I, I actually have a Tennessean I work with, so I got all the names right. Uh, this is not Detroit, it's Deckard. Nonetheless, uh, yeah, Tullahoma is a, a, a city. What happens very quickly in the campaign uh, is Rosecrans outsmarts or outmaneuvers Bragg, forcing him to withdraw from Strong Points in Shelbyville and Wartrace, uh, forcing him down to Tullahoma. He hopes to defend there to keep the rail line available, uh, going again down toward Chattanooga. This is Stevenson, Chattanooga is over here. Uh, but again, he will cross over not only the Duck River, but the Elk River uh, and make a, a fairly well organized retreat, uh, again, resulting in fewer casualties than the other two battles. But to answer your question, Tullahoma uh, is just a location, a town, but it's given the name of the campaign uh, to separate it from what follows after this, which is the Battle of Chickamauga, and then you have Lookout Mountain later on that year uh, after the Gettysburg Address, if I remember correctly. So, Did that answer your question, sir? Sure. Okay. Sure. Next question. Right here, sir, in blue? Right there? Yes. Do you think, though, that Robert E. Lee was the icon of the South? Would he not was, was Robert E. Lee the icon of the South? Go on, sir. Okay. Would he not have to be defeated? Okay. Wouldn't that be the most important? I mean, these other things are very important, but Lee was the icon of the South. 
Yeah, uh, the question is the sim symbolic importance, the material importance, the political importance, the psycholo psychological importance of defeating Robert E. Lee was critical in, in the Civil War. And if he didn't go down, it would be, in other words, he had to go down to the South <laughs> Exactly. Robert E. Lee had to be beaten. <laughs> All right, and the only way to do that was to beat his army down. And that's what the Union Army did at Gettysburg. That is an interesting. <laughs> and, and I have to agree to it for different reasons. Uh, growing up where I did, outside Montgomery, Alabama, where Robert E. Lee High School is you know, one of the focal points, I don't think you can go to a town in the South uh, of size that doesn't have a Robert E. Lee High School. We also have Jefferson Davis and a few other ones to, to go with it. But, uh, uh, but I, think, I think Ethan's correct on that one, uh, although it did take another year and a half uh, before he finally surrendered at Appomattox. So Terry or Greg, I don't know if you have any. Well, I, I, I throw this out to you. I, I grew up, I mean, I was, I was born in upstate New York. I have a southern accent. I grew up in Virginia. So I grew up with Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. And um, I, I, I would say I grew up thinking about, you know, Gettysburg because I'm an East Coast guy, and then I've spent the rest of my life living in Mississippi, Louisiana, and Missouri, okay? And you're introduced to this whole other thing that never mattered when you were studying the Civil War when you were from the East. And I think we, we, have, we have a prejudice uh, to some extent towards those, those Eastern battles, and I say that as an erstwhile Virginian. Um, and uh, when, when you look at them, there are indeed other things that went on, but those are the things that grab our attention. And I think it was Shelby Foote that wrote that if you grew up west of the Blue Ridge Mountains, um, and you were a southerner at least, you grew up dreaming that it was the dawn of the second day at, uh, at Shiloh. And it wasn't <laughs> the third day at Gettysburg. And I think a lot of that is a, a matter of where, where you're from to well, a certain we, we extent, the way the we remember the war. We can connect the Tullahoma campaign with another important figure who was your hero, who performed well at the Hoover's Gap engagement, August Villish. You want to talk a little about him? No, Greg? go ahead, Ethan. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. You can. Go ahead. No, go. You know, um, well, well, oh, okay. No, um, Ethan and I have done several staff rides of, of Chickamauga together. In fact, all of us have, have done those things, and we, we have a tendency to name them something in order to have a <laughs> bit of fun with them. And one of them was the August Village staff ride, and Village is one of the few folks who was uh, too red to be kicked out of the Communist Party in Europe. <laughs> So he came over and fought for the, uh, for the Union forces, and we also uh, enjoy joking occasionally that what the battles around Tullahoma, then Chickamauga, and Chattanooga were really about was bringing rural electrification to, oh, to, to Alabama, oh, uh, Tennessee, boy, yeah. and uh, For and socialization, which August Bullish That's would right. definitely right. endorse. So you asked for it, you got it. <laughs> okay, next question, sir, right here. Yeah, I learned recently reading one of those important guys books about Gettysburg that it was important because Lee not only made a mistake going there in the first place against the 45 divisions of the Union Army, but that his second mistake was to press on on July 30th to Jordan when he should have withdrawn the day before. So that is for the first time it struck me that he made a personal mistake, and that was perhaps the breaking of his mystique as a leader. And it would go along the argument that you presented here that the Union Army had to be defeated once and for all. The question of Robert E. Lee's generalship at Gettysburg. Um, anybody want to take that on in two minutes or less? I'll, yeah, I'll try if you want. Okay. I, mean, I, I would disagree in, in some respects with what you're saying. I mean, first off, I don't believe that he made a mistake going north. Um, you know, as, as Ethan and several of us have talked about, Ethan was not, or I mean, uh, General Lee was not. <laughs> Easy to confuse. <laughs> General, well, you do sometimes get choices between bad and worse choices, so. <laughs> Uh, but General, General Lee does not have good choices. He has really bad and worse choices to make. And I think when you look at the, at the decisions he makes it, uh, in the Gettysburg campaign, pretty much every one can be defended. Now, the execution of those decisions, not so good. Uh, but I think you can make a good argument that Pickett's charge did make sense. Uh, of course, in hindsight, it looks like a disaster. But realistically, you know, when you look at, at, at the options that he has in front of him, and again, he's looking at his choices are poor and worse. It's not, there's, here's the good one, let's do that one. Uh, and realistically, you know, on the sec after the second day's fighting, they're very close to, they came very close to winning uh, in several spots. He thinks that possibly they can, they can just push that last little bit. It, it's not an unrealistic uh, idea. Now, certainly you can, you can fault the execution of the, those attacks on July 3rd. They were disastrously executed. But in terms of the, uh, the basic design of the campaign, I don't, I don't think that that was, that was poor generalship. Randy, you were to say? 
But just a quick addendum from a strategic standpoint is one of the things I did research in Tullahoma is Gettysburg, to a certain degree, Tullahoma and Vicksburg are part of a master plan that the Union has sat down and figured out how can we defeat the South. We realize it's not going to happen overnight. We, we've been there, done that. The Confederacy, not so much. Lee is, I don't want to describe him as an independent operator, but he does have the approval of the president, but so does Bragg and so does Pemberton, okay? But no one seems to unify the Confederate strategy to try to say, what can we do with what we have in 1863 to achieve any meaningful sense of victory? Uh, because there are like three independent operations for the South, but from a Northern perspective, there, there's a, a congruence or a cohesiveness that I think gives the South, or the North rather, even more effect on the, on the South, even though it still takes a year and a half to win. Yeah, Robert E. Lee had a response to his critics, which was, um, he, he said, you know, the South's great mistake at the beginning of the war was we appointed all of our good generals newspaper editors. <laughs> and he said, I always found out after the campaign, there were all these mistakes <laughs> that were made, but these, and the newspapers found all these mistakes and they knew it before, they, apparently they knew it beforehand. I just wish they had had the courtesy to tell me before I made these mistakes. <laughs> and he said, perhaps I should stop being a general so that our good, news, good, our good general, get our good generals out of the newspaper editing business and onto the battlefield, uh, along those lines. Yes, sir, right here. Oh, that's an interesting, uh, that kind of supports my question argument. question was I Jefferson suppose. Davis's love for Braxton Bragg. Go on. Well, they, they, there is a relationship there. Uh, and part of the dilemma for the South, again, from a, a command perspective, is that Davis, um, who is a, a West Point graduate, understand was Secretary of War. I mean, he has a good understanding of the military. But there's always this tendency, reluctance, to remove less than, than um, effective leaders. So he hangs with Bragg far longer than most historians or those newspaper uh, generals that Ethan was referring to were talking about. But the, what we call the command climate today in Bragg's army was just atrocious. Uh, Hardy, Polk, uh, Hill, you name it. There's all sorts of dissension within Bragg's army. They too have connections with Davis, so it, it's a lot of infighting going on. And I, I, again, I don't know much more about it other than what I just stated, uh, but it's a difficult position, I think, for Davis to try to remove who, he is, he, who he's supported for years and years um, uh, to, to do what? Who do you replace him with is the other question. Uh, Joe Johnston, who ultimately does show up, you know, has the interesting responsibility to be responsible for both Bragg's army and Pemberton's army. But that didn't turn out so well because he has some responsibility but no real authority, which is problematic. Uh, unlike the Union, where it's a very clear line uh, chain of command, very capable leaders, and it just works better. Of course, having all those resources and, and other stuff is nice, too. Uh, but it does put a pickle on him. But yes, they were friends. Yes, Davis probably held on to him as a leader far longer than he should have. But again, who, who's left? There, there are no more Lees. Stonewall's dead. What do you do? Yeah. You and uh, question Frank, right here, sir? Frank? Oh. Well, let me... Uh, uh, oh. Well, I, I'd add one other thing, too. I mean, we can't talk about the relationship with Davis and Bragg without mentioning the fact that they served in the key, yeah. the key moment in the Mexican War uh, when Jefferson Davis made his military reputation. And arguably, it makes him a senator, it makes him a secretary of war, and whatnot afterwards. Uh, and uh, an older Civil War historian, Frank Vanderveer, said the Confederacy died of the V, and if Jefferson Davis and the United States had lost at the Battle of Buena Vista in 1847, which is where famously Jefferson Davis, uh, well, uh, Zachary Taylor is purported to have said, Bragg's in charge of an artillery batter, uh, you know, give him, uh, give him more grape, uh, or he uses more earthy terms, you know, Captain Bragg. They served together in Mexico, and I think you can understand the loyalty Davis has to Bragg because of the relationship they had from serving those, those years before in the Mexican War. Uh, did he, was he loyal too long? I think the consensus of opinion is uh, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes he was. Uh, you know, probably a bit more loyal than he needed to be. Okay. New, new questioner right here, sir? Uh, new am? Ma'am? Oh, okay, so your question. Uh, I'd like to ask about somebody who wasn't there, Stonewall Jackson. Uh, uh, I read somewhere that he was morbidly affected by his absence and uh, was this just a romantic fix to uh, improve the uh, agenda afterwards? Stonewall Jackson? Uh, well, <clears throat> and I'm sure this will raise some hackles, but one of the biggest problems is, you know, we do get asked quite a bit, what if Stonewall were at Gettysburg? Well, 
my stock answer is he was stunk pretty bad because he'd been dead for over a you know, couple <laughs> months. Um, <laughs> You know, we, we don't know exactly what he would have done. I mean, certainly, he, he, his, his loss hurt the Confederacy. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and nobody really disputes that because, you know, the Confederacy can l ill afford to lose skilled commanders like Jackson is. Uh, but by the same token, having Jackson there doesn't automatically guarantee that the Confederates win at Gettysburg either. Uh, and, and, I mean, even, I mean, they'd had Jackson with them for, you know, over a year, and they'd won a battle, but they had never annihilated the Confederate Army, so. And I think, I think the, where that question comes in is the legacy of the flank march at Chancellorsville, that had Jackson been, is it Ewell that was on Culp's Hill? Yes, yeah. yeah. Instead of Ewell say, oh, let's stop and rest, Jackson would have pushed the effort, and who knows what would happen at. So it is counterfactual, but uh, assuming it was alive, of course, at, at that yeah. point. So, sir, African American, sir, right here. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we, in reading, I guess, you know, that Robert E. Lee was a, a good tactician and a great general, but I, I also got the impression that one of his key commanders, Longstreet, uh, questioned a lot of his yeah. judgment, mm -hmm. uh, especially at Gettysburg. Go, gentlemen. You want to take that one? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, the, the Longstreet controversy with Lee is uh, it's been one of the enduring controversies of Gettysburg, in large part because after the war, uh, Longstreet became a Republican, which was anathema to white Southerners. And so consequently, Longstreet became a very, very popular. How could Robert E. Lee lose? Well, there must have been some, you know, figure twirling his mustache and figuring, ah, I'll bring him down. Um, and so they focus a lot on Longstreet's conduct at Gettysburg. And, you know, Gettysburg, the, the Gettysburg battle, where the war was lost, and Longstreet's conduct is the reason Gettysburg was lost, then he must have been the nail for the want of the war was lost. Henry? Yes. I, I wouldn't for a minute begin to suggest that the Battle of Cabin Creek, <laughs> first or second, <laughs> That would be Terry. That would be Terry. <laughs> that would be Terry. Well, I, go, Terry, well, go. Well, one, I mean, one thing before Terry starts, along with Cabin Creek, is you just mentioned Helena, too. Well, that's why I was, I mean, see, I, that's why I asked Henry, did you mean first or second Cabin Creek? There's <laughs> actually two battles at Cabin Creek, and, and neither of them took place in 63. One was in 64. The big one was in 64 during Price's Raid. The, the, battle, the battle of Honey Springs is the big battle that takes place. <laughs> Well, the, the, the bigger one that take, the bigger one where they take, like, that Stan Wade takes the raid into Indian territory, that takes place in 64 during, the, during Price's raid. Um, it's the historians are allowed to have the argument with that in. But, but the, big, the big battle I think you're talking about is the biggest battle in Indian territory. It takes place on July 17th, and that does take place at, the, at Honey Springs. Uh, While Indian we work out this issue, <laughs> let's go to another question. <laughs> Man in the back? No. Oh. Go ahead, All right, go on. Uh, okay, well, the, the battle, the, the two big battles I think you're talking about is the Battle of Honey Springs in the Indian Territory and the Battle of Helena, Arkansas, which are probably the two biggest battles. Helena takes place on July 4th. Uh, Helena is on the Mississippi River. Uh, it's Arkansas's. <laughs> <laughs> Helena, which takes place on July 4th, the day that Vicksburg, in fact, it takes place literally while Vicksburg is surrendering. Uh, it, it, basically, it's the Confederacy's attempt to rescue Vicksburg, but the fact that it, it, it takes place the day of the surrender tells you that it was too late. And that's kind of the way that the best to describe the Confederacy's operations in, in, in uh, the Trans-Mississippi, too little and too late. Um, the Battle of Honey Springs, which takes place on the 17th of July, that's a very significant battle. Uh, the biggest battle of the war in Indian Territory, what's modern-day Oklahoma, uh, that's the battle which basically seals uh, 
the, the, the southern border for at least a little while with, with Missouri and, and actually makes uh, Indian territory, turns it into chaos. Uh, for the rest of the war, Indian territory is largely just overrun by guerrillas. It's an absolute mess. It's a terrible place to be a civilian. And uh, that, that, that by the time that we get to Vicksburg and this type, it's, the, the, the Trans-Mississippi is largely a backwater, even though I do find it fascinating. I agree with you on that one. But uh, from Pea Ridge on, it's, it's a backwater. Back in the back. Yes. Yep. No. I, 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 ab oh, yeah. ab absolutely. Absolutely. That's where the photographers are in 1863 as well. Uh, absolutely. It's more more immediate. Um, and and that the the oh, yeah, west yeah, yeah. Okay. the western theater suffers from that throughout throughout the okay. war. Next two questions. This gentleman back here. Yeah. If there's a failure at Gettysburg. That's actually the second battle at Cabin Creek they're talking about. I think that, that question has been brought up a lot, the question of a failed pursuit uh, after Lee's defeat. And the, the, looking at the, at the way Lee is retreating back on his line of supplies, which is a little bit easier, and he's retreating through a mountain pass. Once he gets through the mountain pass, the mountain pass separates him from the Federals. The Federals have got to change their line of supplies two or three times to catch up with them. So it's probably just those fat, those Physical, logistical limitations are why Lee was able to get away. But there's no question that Lincoln is very, very frustrated afterwards because he believes that there's a golden opportunity to catch Lee's army and defeat it north of the Potomac River. And the same thing happens with, with Rosecrans. You, you had an army, why didn't you bag it? Similar issues with the uh, Duck River and the Elk River because, well, it rained a lot in Middle Tennessee once the campaign got underway. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the most uh, clever descriptions I heard, it wasn't just a mess, method of sprinkling, it was a Baptist downpour. Mm -hmm. uh, is the way one of the soldiers described uh, uh, the rain and the mud and the muck. And it did a number on the pursuit as well as the uh, uh, Bragg and his retreating army. So some interesting parallels with Lee crossing the Potomac because the water had to go down and all that sort of stuff. Right in front. Here. I, 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 little, little comment about to the home up at first, and then I have a question for you. Um, I spent a summer in Tula, uh, Tullahoma with my daughter and enjoyed their history and everything like that. But the most important thing we heard was uh, the saving of Lynchburg, which is the home of the <laughs> Jack Daniels. <laughs> <laughs> any, any problem with that? Okay. Any, do I hear any amens out there? So, yes. It's, it's a, a question. A, a, a comment for you. you So many different times, but never authoritatively, um, the the stance of Longstreet to Lee about not there should be someplace else to 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 uh, make the stand. Uh, the question Longstreet came up with his idea after the first day of battle, successful day, successful day of engage, first engagement, <laughs> of maneuvering to the south and trying to get between the Union army. Now the movie Gettysburg, of course, the, and the movie the novel of Kill, Killer Angels has made a lot of the Lee Longstreet debate. And it's done a lot to rehabilitate Longstreet to the point that he finally has a statue on the battlefield. But the rehabilitation, sometimes if the criticism swung one way, the rehab swings the other. Uh, but it, Longstreet had a proposal, swing around to the south and try to get between the, the Army of the Potomac and Washington and force the Federals to attack him. The problem is that with that is, we'd have to assume that the Federals we're not prepared for that. But in fact, the Union cavalry is patrolling to the south. Had they tried to disengage and do that, the Federal Army would have picked it up pretty quickly. So it was probably an unrealistic move. In addition, as much as the first day had gone well for Lee, no reason to pull off and to leave the battlefield then. Second day goes fairly well. Third day doesn't go so well, but you don't know that until after you've, after you've done it. Uh, so, but this, this argument between Longstreet, Longstreet's maneuver looks good on, the, on, on paper and on the map. But it has to assume the Federal Army is not making any preparations for that move. And it's an obvious move, and the Federals do have cavalry down there patrolling. That's where Buford goes. John Buford, the hero of the first day of the battle, second, third days of the battle, he is out patrolling that southern flank, and he would have picked up on that. Uh, and, and, and in that same way, uh, with um, uh, Longstreet, uh, one of the criticisms is that Longstreet drug his feet on the second day. Uh, was that true? Actually, we, there have been. Replications of, Lee, of Longstreet's march that have been done in modern time. And they have found that he probably made as good a time as he could have done and got, get in a position. Now, there are problems. 
Longstreet had reasons for delaying the march. They had to do a reconnaissance. Uh, and it was just a march that was going to take a long time that day. The big issue is they're marching over one road. They've got a counter march because, unbeknownst to them previously, their route is in full view of the, of, the fed, of the Federals on Little Round Top. So they've got a counter march, and that adds time. Modern groups have done the march, replicated it, and they suggested that Longstreet probably moved about as quickly as he could at that day. If he was dragging, there, there's no, if he was dragging his feet, then the modern people with their modern boots, modern clothes, full hydration, um, they dragged their feet. And keep in mind, some of Longstreet's men had, not Longstreet's, some of Longstreet's, yeah, Longstreet's men, Law's brigade had to make a 25 mile march that day before they attacked Little Round Top. So it was, it, they were asking a lot of these guys and asking, hey, you guys, I know you marched 20 miles, but now move faster. When modern people can't move much faster, it's probably too much to, to it's a little ahistorical. Back there, sir. Mm -hmm. We've got black men fighting some mean hives in the South. We're gonna we're gonna stick it to nowhere mm -hmm. with what the war's about. Okay. There's a lot of backlash out in the North. I mean part of that underpinning of the draft riot is we don't want the war for abolition. Mm -hmm. I mean I think there was a fear at Gettysburg that uh, if the North would have lost and the Southernites would have come back out and mm -hmm. you know, pushed the uh, congressional or the the, the, the the gubernatorial elections to the Democrats and the guys like Clement Delancey and Delancey. Mm -hmm. One of the, well, we got an hour or so, so it's the yeah. opposite. <laughs> One last question here, sir. Okay, I, I, I'm going to begin to preach it from the war riot, uh, New York draft riot a few months ago. That's about 12 back in the May. Was there any domestic disturbances within the Confederacy over 1953 or any other time that was as dangerous for their cause as the New York draft riot or the Cuban Missile Clause? Was there, was there insurrection that the Confederate Army Yeah, I don't remember when the Richmond. You had the Richmond bread riots in March 1863, but nothing that re reached that level where they had to call troops from the front to put it down, which they did here at the New York draft riots well, here. And I, I yeah. sir, I, I throw this out to you too. Um, you know, there, there's a there's a historiographical argument that argues the South never was a real nation. No, I mean never <laughs> came together. Uh, a, a, as a nation, and there are fracture points um, politically, uh, you know, throughout it. When you have a nation that's founded on, on secession, and yet it's not validated in the right of secession, and validated in your constitution, coming together when you've got folks that essentially have come together about one thing is we don't like this doesn't mean you necessarily are going to cooperate once you've come together, and so there are friction points politically at home relative to. Uh, resources shared by states uh, with the national government. It doesn't help, again, coming back to Vicksburg, the Jefferson Davis victory gives him gravitas, gives him authority, and he doesn't get them anywhere in 1863. The consequence for that is, who do you turn to? And you turn to people like Robert E. Lee, because you can get behind the military hero, but your primary person you could rally behind, the president of the Confederacy, is essentially uh, you know, lost that ability to make his pitch, and it will only get worse, even if it isn't manifested in social unrest in cities. But of course, we need to remember the South doesn't have a whole lot of cities, and to have good riots, you have to have big crowds <laughs> of people. <laughs> it's a Met T issue. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so. To wrap up. As, as a good, I mean, a good point here about we are focusing on battlefield events, and obviously, 1863 is a big, is a big, is a big, big subject. Many events that took place 
Uh, the draft riots, the Battery Wagner action, the implementation of such things as the Homestead Act, the Morrill Land Grant Act that would have long-term consequences. However, in 1863, the commemoration almost always starts coming back to Gettysburg. Uh, 7.30 in the morning on the 1st of July, 1863, um, a lieutenant in the Union Cavalry by the name of Marcellus Jones told his sergeant to give him his carbine so he could fire a shot at the Confederates that were viewed approaching from the direction of South Mountain. This Lieutenant Marcellus Jones is famous. This is the first shot of the Battle of Gettysburg at 7.30 in the morning on, in, on the 1st of July, 1863, near the home of Ephraim Whistler. On the 1st of July, 2013, at 06.30 in the morning, a little girl was roused, rousted from her bed her comfortable bed at the hotel at Gettysburg, in force mar not force marched, <laughs> but, <laughs> but brought with their father out to the Whistler house and this marker here that commemorates the first shot that was fired in the Battle of Gettysburg. 150 years of the day, she and I were there. And, uh, and, and, and then shortly after we, were, we got there, we got there a little early, and then the group started coming for a little commemoration of the first shot at Gettysburg. And we, it was a nice little ceremony. They toasted what happened. And uh, the Pittsburgh Post-Dispatch was there. And in a story the next day, they, they reported talking to some historians, including the daughter of one who was there <laughs> doing, who was there and heading off to do some research. Uh, and just thinking about it, 1963 was the centennial of the Civil War. Um, I wasn't around in 1963 for the centennial. I wasn't even alive. 2063, I don't anticipate I'll be around 50 years from now uh, for the bicentennial of the Civil War. Um, but I was there with my daughter on the morning of the sesquicentennial of the first shot of the Battle of Gettysburg. And reflecting and thinking that 50 years from now when the bicentennial does come, that perhaps, some, perhaps she will be there, not just with her child, but perhaps with her grandchild. She's 10 now. She'll be 60 <laughs> then. So perhaps, you know, great-grandchild will be there with her. Perhaps remember how dad dragged her out there on this. And so, and talk about the way we keep coming back to this, this war and how it spans the generations. I figured I would let her finish off Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain's dedication speech at the monuments in 1888. Corinne, come up here. <laughs> In great deeds, something abides. On great fields, something stays. Forms change and pass. Bodies disappear. But spirits linger to consecrate ground for a vision place of souls. And reverent men and women from afar and generations that know us not and that we know not of. Heart drawn to see where and by whom great things were suffered and done for them shall come to this deathless field to ponder and dream and love. The shadow of mighty presence shall wrap them in its bosom and the power of the vision pass into their souls. Anything for applause. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Again, uh, Henry, we're pretty much wrapped up on time. I will ask you to give a round of applause to our panelists. <laughs> Terry Beckenbaugh, Greg Hospidor, Randy Mullis. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure that if you, if you want to stick around for a little bit, ask us questions one-on-one, -on -one, we'll be glad to do so. And uh, thank you for coming. And Henry, I would turn it back over to you. Thank you, Ethan, and as I suggested, the Civil War Sesquicentennial series continues next year. We'll see you then.